Well, I do want to especially thank Todd for stepping up and to let me lead you in singing this morning. And that's bad enough on good days, but uh, I mowed yesterday, so you can hear it. Um, how many of you have been to Jerusalem and seen the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Anybody? I was just kind of wondering. It has nothing to do with the sermon. Really. But I read a story this week about failure, and it has to do with that church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. If you go there, above the entrance, you'll see, oh, you'll see a blue wall. No. Okay, next slide. Now you'll see a ladder above the entrance leading to a, a window, an old wooden ladder. And the tour guide that's there with you will probably tell you the story of the ladder. It, it's a visible reminder of a 300-year disagreement between the various Christian factions that care for that church. They're, they're the Greek Orthodox, the Armenian Apostolic, the Roman Catholic, the Coptic, the Ethiopian, and the Syriac Orthodox Church. All of those are involved in caring for that building. And they couldn't come to agreements when it came down to dividing up the responsibilities for caring for the building. So they came up with rules about who gets to use what part of the building when and be in what part of the building when and is responsible for what. And when those rules get broken, it leads to violence. In 2008, a fist fight broke out between the Armenian and the Greek monks. One part of the roof of the building is disputed area between the Copts and Ethiopians. So a Coptic monk sits out there in a chair in order to mark their claim to that part of the roof all the time. And one summer day, the monk responsible for chair sitting moved his chair a little bit over so he could get a little bit of shade and the Ethiopians considered this a hostile act of aggression. And by the time the fight was over, 11 men were in the hospital. Remarkably, the disagreements extend all the way to housekeeping. Who gets to clean what? Sometime in the early 1700s, someone, nobody knows who, leaned a ladder up against a window to clean it, but never took the ladder down, and no one claims responsibility for that area now and wants to start a fight over the ladder. Now, it's easy to hear about the ladder and think, boy, that is ridiculous. Because honestly, it is ridiculous, right? But the fact is, most of us know that there are a lot less visible ladders in our churches and in our Christian homes. We know of disagreements between believers they go unresolved for lifetimes. Instead of a ladder, it's two ladies sitting at different sides of the sanctuary every Sunday because they don't want to get too close. Or maybe it, it, it's two men who always look for a certain name on the sign-up sheet for the men's prayer breakfast to know if it's one they want to skip. Or maybe it's that married couple that everyone avoids when they first arrive at church because they know about what must have been like in the car on the way. Right? I mean, the fact is, Christians still have disagreements, don't we? We do. Disagreements, disputes, and quarrels, and sometimes pretty bad ones. But guess what? God cares about how we deal with our disagreements in the body of Christ, in the church. And, and the church in Corinth, can you guess? They were getting it wrong. They were getting it wrong. And we're in 1 Corinthians 6 this morning, and, well, if you remember, it's not really been that great for the church in Corinth in the first five chapters either. The first four chapters were all about Paul rebuking the church because they were worldly and divided up into factions. And last week we looked in chapter 5, and we saw how they weren't dealing with sin right. The way they dealt with sin was wrong. And this week, now when we get to chapter 6, we're going to look at how they're dealing with disagreements wrongly in the church. Last week it was dealing with sin, this week it's dealing with disagreements. And just like we needed to follow God's plan for dealing with sin in the church, we need to follow God's plan for dealing with disagreements in the church. 
Paul broaches the topic with the church with a cutting question in verse 1. So I'm going to ask that if you're able, you'd stand once more and we'll read this passage from God's Word. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Heavenly Father, what a, what a good word for us this morning as we, as we hear you speak about how to deal with our disagreements, but also as we hear you remind us of what you've done with our sin. So God, I pray that we, as those who have been washed, sanctified, clean, would hear this word and, and, and take it to heart that we might reflect that washing in our walk with you and with one another. And Lord, as we reflect on this, I also pray for the one who's here this morning and has not placed their faith in Christ, has not trusted him to, to be the one who sanctifies, who justifies them. Lord, I pray that today they would be saved. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so, there are going to be disagreements in the church, in Christian families, right? Some of them are going to be significant. Thankfully, God did not leave us to the world's devices to solve our disagreements. In 1 Corinthians 6, these first 11 verses, Paul is actually rebuking the church in Corinth. And as he does, he really teaches us three lessons for how to deal with disagreements in the body of Christ, disagreements in the church. And he begins there at the beginning and tells us that the church must deal with disagreements as an eschatological community. I'll explain that, as an eschatological community. Verse 1 describes the problem, right? Members are taking other church members to pagan secular courts to resolve their disagreements. In verse 3 sounds like the matter is, you know, it's nothing of eternal significance here. Because the words defrauding shows up. It's probably a financial disagreement between two members. It's definitely matters pertaining to this life. And verse 8 makes it sound financial too. There's fraud involved. So members of the body of Christ are, are taking their, their basic disagreements and they're going to the world saying, world, solve the problem for us. And Paul's first response is this. He says, such behavior shows that you have forgotten that you, the church, are an eschatological. You are the church of the end. You are the church that is forever. That's what an eschatological community is. It's the community of the new heavens and the new earth. It's the end times community of the people of God, the consummated kingdom of God. He says, you are that people. Church, you are that community. Verse 2, the, the church will judge the world in the end. So how crazy is it that the church would take these trivial matters and not deal with them in the church, but go to secular people who aren't going to be over eternal matters. It's like asking a judge at the annual Westminster Dog Show to, to go to a cat lover for advice about which dog to pin the ribbon on. It just makes no sense. The, the world is operating with an understanding of reality 
that won't survive into eternity. When you go to the world, their way of thinking is not going to last forever like yours. So why would you go to them for judgment on anything, Paul says? And then in verse 3, the church will even judge the fallen angels in the last days. It'll be an eternal heavenly judgment over the fallen angels and the church will be there judging them. So how crazy is it to think the church is not capable of judging its own disagreements and resolving those in the body? It's kind of like the first question, but with the volume turned up a little bit. It says the church is going to stand side by side with Jesus when Jesus pronounces judgment on the rebellious angels who followed Satan. He says, you know, church, you're going to be there doing that, the stuff of that world. How, how nuts is it that you don't think you're able to judge the things of this world in the church? Again, it's asking a brain surgeon to, to go to a five-year-old daughter and ask for, for, for advice on how to take aspirin. It, it makes no sense. And in verse 4, this is kind of a summary of the first two questions. If the church has standing in this perfect, consummated kingdom of God as judges, why would it ever go outside the church to do judgment? And in verse 5, Paul does as he occasionally does. He uses a little sarcasm to bring the point home, as if the questions weren't enough. He asks him this question. Is, is, it, is it because you're, you're all incompetent that you're going outside the church? Is that why it is? Is that the problem? We'll, we'll see later in this letter that the church leaders in Corinth think they have special wisdom. They believe they are the wisest of all people. They have wisdom that Paul doesn't have. And so here Paul says, look, are you really not wise enough to be able to do this? I mean, look at these questions and think about this. Has anyone ever told you that the Bible's not relevant today? Has anybody ever said that to you? Look at what Paul's saying here. He's saying the church is an eternal community. That the church lasts forever as the church. That the church is, is, is eternal and it will judge sinners and fallen angels made new in Christ. The church is being ready for that day. The church now, today, has had 2,000 years to study the Bible together and to think about the word of God and the words of Christ. Yet the church still gets in, in, in disagreements but never trusts the church to help resolve them. It goes and stands brother against brother in the courts of men. It goes and trusts the wisdom of the world to bring better results than it does trust its own people. And what Paul wants the church to understand to keep her from getting this wrong is that she is more qualified, better equipped, and wiser than that world that it's tempted to turn to to resolve its disagreements. The church is the right now manifestation of the eternal kingdom of God. The church must deal with disagreements as that eschatological community. So what do we do with a reminder like this? How, how do we make that work? Well, first of all, we have to believe it, right? You actually have to believe this is true. You'll never do anything with the commands of the Word of God unless you believe them. So you need to believe, if you're a Christian, that you are part of that community that one day will stand in judgment over fallen men and angels. That that is, is who you are, who God is making you right now. But you don't need to just believe it, you need to embrace it. You need to say, and that matters now. So you believe that that will happen then, but you believe this, will, this matters now. Unless you say this matters now, you're, you're never going to really make anything of it. It's, it's a pie in the sky when you die thing. But you have to embrace it now. And then you need to obey it. We, we need to ask ourselves what obedience looks like here. And then do something about it. We need to take our disagreements and say, you know, where do I need to go in the body of Christ to get these things resolved? with that in the body of Christ really meaning something. 
and trusting one another in that, thinking, you know what, if he said that about the church in Corinth, that they should have wisdom to do it, well, they're the most messed up church in the New Testament. Surely, there'd be wisdom here to do it. So the question is, do you believe it? Are you embracing it? And are you willing to obey it? So the church has to deal with disagreement as an eschatological community, an end times community. But the church also has to dis deal with disagreement as a selfless community. As a selfless community. <laughs> Verse 7 is something, isn't it? I mean, if you look at what he says, he says to have lawsuits at all with one another is already defeat for you. You see what Paul's saying, right? He's calling them losers, right? A little biblical version of it. But he says, you guys are losers. No matter how the case turns out, right? You take it to court, no matter how it turns out, you lose because you took it to court. You lose because you have declared the church, of which you are a member, is incompetent to deal with disagreements. You, you lose because you have declared that the Holy Spirit that inhabits the body of Christ cannot lead the body of Christ to deal with disagreements. You lose because you have declared that repentance and forgiveness like we depend in in the gospel is not enough to help us when we have disagreements between one another and the body of Christ. So when you go out and you take these lawsuits to the secular world, when you go to the secular world to solve problems in the body, you lose. So Paul asked these two questions that, that, that really hit the nail on the head. He says, why not suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Wouldn't that be better than to go out in the world and lose by declaring that you don't believe the church is what Christ made her? That's his point. He says, wouldn't you rather suffer some sort of temporal loss then do damage to the reputation of your brother in Christ or of the church. Wouldn't you rather suffer temporal loss? Would you not rather be defrauded by a brother and suffer the pain that brings than bring shame to the name of Christ or show by your deeds that you don't trust your brothers and sisters? Well, Paul's asking this, do you care so much about the things of this world that you would do damage to the church in order to get your rights. And he says that's not the way of Christ. That's not the way of Christ because the way of Christ is the way of humility, the way of selflessness. It's the way of the one who left the throne room of heaven and the rights of the throne room of heaven and took on flesh to die to save you from sin. In verse 8, Paul concludes, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brother. And that kind of seems like it goes against the flow of the argument. Isn't the problem that they're being wronged and they're going to court with it? So how can the person who was wronged be wronging the other brother by taking them to court? Well, the answer has a lot to do with the Roman court system. If you had status or money in the Roman system, you won your court cases, right? If you were a powerful person and you showed up at court or you were a person with money, you didn't lose your court cases. The people who had the most won the most. So when people in the church were choosing to take their brothers to court, they weren't gonna do that if they were the poor people. It was the rich people who are a problem in Corinth, we're gonna see later, it's the rich people taking their poor brothers to court knowing they would always win. So Paul is going after the wealthy and powerful church members who have disagreements and know that if they take it to the world, they'll always win because of their status. But the big problem is still that big problem of the heart is they want to win over their brother or sister in Christ. That that's their goal to win in this temporal matter over a brother or sister in Christ. They refuse to live the selfless life that we must live if we're going to follow Jesus. You know, in my limited experience, counseling couples regarding disagreements in their marriage, which they're pretty bad by the time anyone ever comes to talk to me about them, I can tell you that much. One thing stands out above every other thing I've ever discussed. In fact, I would say it is the reason 
why more Christian husbands and wives take their disagreement to secular authorities by going to divorce courts. And it is simply this. In the disagreement, they have to win. They've got to win. If, if one side would simply say, I will suffer loss for the sake of this marriage and the name of Christ in our marriage, you wouldn't have to go there. Now, I'm not saying always. I'm saying that's my experience in the ones I've counseled. I understand there are other stories out there. But generally, the issue when it comes to me is somebody has to win. That's not the selflessness that we should be showing if we're following Christ. Now, the church must deal with disagreement as an eschatological and a selfless community. And the church must also deal with disagreement as a kingdom community. As a kingdom community. It's pretty clear in, in the question Paul asks in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The saints will judge the world when the king returns and establishes his kingdom. The saints will judge the fallen angels when the Lord returns and establishes his kingdom. And that makes the incompetence and unwillingness of the saints to resolve disagreements between the brethren in the church foolish. And maybe they thought God was really not going to clean house before he set up shop. Maybe they thought God was going to establish his kingdom on earth and let them live in the mess they've made. Maybe they thought he was going to let some sinners go ahead and slide into the kingdom. Maybe they thought that, you know, this is the way it will always be, is there will always be wicked people in the, in the body, and, and so we're just going to have to go to the courts. But Paul reminds them, no. In the kingdom of Christ, it will be a kingdom of righteousness. And he gives a list, right? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, the men who practice homosexuality, the thieves, the greedy, the drunkards, the revilers... The swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. On that final day of judgment, the church will be there and Christ their Savior and Lord will be there and the church will echo the judgment of Christ on the unrepentant sinner. As the unrepentant sinner stands there, the church will say, yes, it is right that God send him to hell. The unrepentant, sexually immoral person they will cast into hell. The unrepentant idol worshiper will be cast into hell. The unrepentant adulterer will be cast into hell. The unrepentant homosexual will be cast into hell. The unrepentant thief will be cast into hell. The unrepentant greedy person will be cast into hell. The unrepentant drunk will be cast into hell. The unrepentant foul mouth insulter of good will be cast into hell. The unrepentant con man will be cast into hell. In that final judgment, the church will say a loud amen. We agree that this can have no place in the perfect kingdom of Christ. The church will make a loud pronouncement on that day. So how in the world, if she's willing to do that, would she ever be unwilling to sit down with brothers and sisters in Christ who are in disagreement and work it out? Why would the church not be willing to do that if on that day she's going to be able to say yes, eternal damnation to the unrepentant sinner? I mean, think about that. And put a face on one of those. Someone you know who doesn't know Christ and one day you will say amen and Christ passes judgment on them. That's, that's, that's just... It's mind-boggling to think of. You will be part of that hard judgment on that day. How could we not deal with the matters of life here and now together as the body of Christ if we can do that hard thing on that day? Because the only way we'll do that hard thing on that day is if we agree with Christ. And we will. And today we will do this thing, this lesser thing, if we agree with Christ. Because that's what a kingdom community acts like. Now, lest they start to think 
This place in the eternal jury box is a reason to be arrogant. I really appreciate this. Paul reminds them, he says, and such were some of you. Now, don't think on that day you're going to be standing by Christ saying amen because you were good. Because you didn't ever do any of this. You're going to be standing there with Christ because you were one of them who got washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were one of the bad people, too, who got rescued. And can you see what that means when it comes to dealing with resolving disagreements in the church? It means that when we come to one another to resolve disagreements in the church, none of us stands there as the righteous one above the other, above the unrighteous one. None of us can look down our noses at this disagreement. We all come to it as the wicked one who has been washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so what do we bring? How do we resolve these disagreements? We say, brothers and sisters, Repent and forgive. Because that's the good news. That's what Christ has done for you. He forgave you when you were wicked and horrible and did horrible things to Him and your rebellion against Him. Forgive one another in Christ. You see, once we understand, we read that, you know, we read that list, and I've heard so many sermons that preach about the evilness of things in that list and miss the whole point, that such were some of you is the point that the gospel takes those kind of people and redeems them. So if we're, going to res if, if we're going to deal with disagreements in the church, we've got the most powerful tool known to creation to deal with it. We have the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom that we can use to resolve disagreements that makes selfless people out of selfish people. I mean, he wants, he wants them to look at those people who are dealing with these disputes and they're going to court and they're doing it all wrong. He wants to look at them and go, oh, but there but for the grace of God go I. Well, let's help them deal with this in the church. So as the church sits in judgment over matters of disagreement in the church, she is very, very qualified to do so because she has been shown grace and mercy in her sin. And she will be humble because she knows that she is only there able to help because of the grace of God in her life. The church must deal with disagreements as a kingdom community. When you wrap disagreements between brothers and sisters in the gospel, they just look different. I mean, some of you do that at Christmas, right? You buy somebody something small and wonderful and you wrap it in a box the size of a truck. That's kind of what the gospel does to our disagreements. It changes their appearance completely. We can deal with these matters if we all come to them as kingdom people who were taken out of this sinful muck and mire and cleaned up by the blood of Christ. When Christians start looking at disagreements, disputes, and quarrels and accept God's way of dealing with sin, they become the church of the redeemed and they're able to solve their problems. Church must deal with disagreement as an eschatological, selfless kingdom community. In other words, it really, when, when, when matters come up between brothers and sisters, even when it's not matters of sin, because there are disagreements that are just disagreements, we still are served by taking a little bit of a Matthew 18-ish approach to dealing with it. When it comes up, what do you do? Well, a brother goes to a brother and says, hey, we've got something between us and we need to work it out. You, know, so you, you don't have to wait till it's sin between you to go brother to brother and say, we have a disagreement. We need to work it out because it, it, not every disagreement is a matter of sin. So, so you go, you, you go mature brother or sister in Christ one to another and you say, let's work it out. Now, if you can't, just like Matthew 18. Get a, get a mature brother or sister in Christ you trust to come and say, hey, we've got this going. It's disagreement, but we are brothers or sisters or brother and sister in Christ, and we want it fixed. Help us, brother, deal with this. And if that brother's not able to deal with it, 
Maybe bring another one involved. Maybe this time you, you, go to, you go to your deacon or you go to your pastor and say, look, we've tried and I even brought this guy in and we still couldn't work this out. Let's work this out. Let's work this out. And, and, and uh, I mean, I, I believe God will honor that. I believe God will honor that. Now, there is no Matthew 18, you, you, you to turn them over to Satan type thing at the end if we're not dealing with sin. Though if you're absolutely unwilling to resolve your, your, your disagreements and, and, and sacrifice a little self in order to resolve your disagreements, you might be on the realm of talking about Matthew 18 and sin soon. But the fact is, we, we, we need to say, hey, we trust the church to help us when we disagree. Now, we have to be willing to talk to each other when we disagree. You know, behaving like six-year-olds isn't going to work. Talk to each other, try to work it out, get help, and, and deal with our disagreements. And, and that will be hard for us. And I think I know why. It's because we watch too many legal dramas on television where we root for the hero to win. Right? I mean, think about how much TV is based on getting you to side with somebody in, in a courtroom drama. I mean, it's been crazy. It's been going on since before Perry Mason. And that's a long time. And he wasn't very nice. I watched one of those old ones. But, but we watch all those. And, and what that writes into our head is that whenever there's a disagreement, we want to have the best argument so that we can always win. Right? That that's it. That's how we resolve disagreements. We have the best argument so we can win. And, and, and don't tell me you don't know what I'm talking about because a lot of you are married. Right? I mean, you, you know, it, it gets to that point and you realize all I'm trying to do is win. The biblical solution as, as led by the church here will either be a win for everybody or a self-sacrificing loss for everybody. It'll be reconciliation and peacemaking above winning. It'll be where both parties are act, asked to be humble. It'll be one where practical resolution will be no more significant than the idea that we need to resolve our relationship. And maybe as you hear this about resolving disagreements, you can't imagine such a thing arising in the church. And God bless your heart. I hope you can stay that way, but I doubt it. Because I, I have, I've sat with too many husbands and wives who are disagreeing and looking to win. I've seen too many churches broken by disagreements about things as theologically important as to what instruments we should use when we have music on Sunday morning. I've heard of too many brothers in Christ who quit speaking to other for years, years over simple disagreements. And I've read too many articles about churches and Christians who still think the best way to resolve our problems is going to secular courts and trusting the world to fix it for us. And as I think back, I can't think of any of those cases where the cause of Christ was glorified in the outcome. Not one. So brethren, let's do this. Let, let's resolve today to deal with our disagreements as followers of Jesus Christ. To make that the most important thing in how we deal with our disagreements. And, and, and maybe as I'm talking about this, you've got one in mind this morning that you're dealing with. Can I encourage you to say, hey, I, I am not going to let this day go by before I at least develop a plan to deal with this disagreement in a way that will bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. And, and that may, me, may mean that you have to answer Paul's question, wouldn't you rather be defrauded? Wouldn't you rather suffer loss than to have this broken bond between you and a brother and sister in Christ? I mean, think about the words Paul uses in the book of Ephesians when he's trying to deal with the, like the greatest disagreement in the culture in his day. The greatest disagreement in his culture was between Jews and Gentiles. 
right? I mean, and, and that came right into the church, right? Because Jews had this, this whole history with the God of, of creation and, and, and the law and Abraham and Moses and David, and they had all of that, and then they become Christians, and they bring all that with them, and it makes sense because we even bring that with us as Gentiles now. But they're bringing all that with them, and this new church, suddenly Gentiles are believing in Jesus. Who, who aren't even circumcised for heaven's sake. Who eat pig. Right? And, and so that's all happening in the church. And you got like the biggest disagreement you could ever have. Books of the New Testament are dealing, focusing on that disagreement. And what Paul tells them is, what you forget is that this happened. Is that God came and in Jesus Christ... He dealt with the law. And the law is that big wall of hostility that divides you. Because the Jew looks at the Gentile as unable to come to God because he doesn't have that law. And the Gentile looks at the Jew and says, you're always holding that law over us and it's not our law. So it is a wall of hostility. But in Jesus Christ, God came and he took care of that law problem once for all. Tore down the wall of hostility, Paul says. And then he made you one new man. And then he took that one new man and reconciled him to God. Read it. Read Ephesians. He doesn't say he brought you to Jesus and now that you're all in Jesus, hey, get along. He said he destroyed the thing that kept you apart, brought you together, and then brought you to Jesus. It was his plan from day one is the point. So what he's saying is, look, the blood of Christ is able to resolve the greatest ethnic disagreement in the first century. The biggest cultural problem in the church in the first century he says the blood of Christ is enough to get over that disagreement. Now, it wasn't easy. Peter and Paul had to have it out once over that. But it was enough. It was enough. And once we really understand that this is the community we are, the community that's in Christ will always be in Christ. His kingdom people called to follow him in humility and selflessness, we will work hard to resolve our disagreements in the body of Christ in a way that will glorify him in the world instead of going to the world that his name might be drugged through the dirt. So I want to pray for you this morning that, that, that if you've got one of these disagreements going on in your life that needs to be dealt with, that you will deal with it even today in a way that will glorify God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and, Lord, your, your word challenges us in the way we think about the way we deal with those things that come between us. Lord, indeed, I, I know myself too often I have looked to win for myself, not considering what that said about who I was in Christ or, or, or who my brother or sister was in Christ. God, I, as I ask for forgiveness, Lord, I, I think many of my brothers and sisters are probably asking the same, saying, Lord, too often I, I, I've, I've been selfish, not selfless. I've not lived like your kingdom was the kingdom that really mattered. So God, forgive us because of Jesus. Cleanse us from that sin. Wash us once more. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters out here who have things that are standing between them and their, their brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, things of this world, God, help them. Help them come together as brother and sister and, and, and in humility and devotion to the gospel. Reconcile them. Make them that one once again. And Lord, I, I also pray for the one who'd be here this morning who's never really known that the power of the blood of Christ to forgive them of their sin, who hears that, that list of, of wicked sins and say, well, some of those aren't so bad. Lord, I pray that this morning you would convict them of their sin. Help them to see that, that it is indeed cosmic rebellion against a good creator God. 
and then open their eyes that they might see Jesus as the Son of God sent by a loving Father to rescue them from the penalty their rebellion deserves. Save them today, Lord. And Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Todd's going to come lead us in our closing hymn, and as he does, I would just ask you to deal with God's Word in your own life. I can't, can't promise you it's going to be easy, but if you're following Christ, I can promise you it's good. And so I just encourage you to follow Jesus in this um, as you sing and declare that you have decided to follow Jesus. Please stand.